Take your Bibles, if you would, please. Turn to Revelation chapter 17. <clears throat> I've, I've had um, like a study on my heart this week, and I'm thinking about preaching a series of messages on this particular topic. I'm going to see what the Lord brings. This may be the only message I preach out of this topic, uh, but there may be more. One of the things that I'm very thankful for, very thankful, is that after after God spent time chastening me about my life, about things that were going on, about being ready to step into the role of pastor here, after God chastened me, after God dealt with me, he then took me gently and he sort of brought a peace and a stillness to my heart. And God said, Mike, now your job here is different than it ever has been. Up until that time, I was managing a Christian school and just sort of overseeing a, a daycare center. And then I had, to, I had to get used to the role of studying. And, you know, before all of this, I used to work in construction. Well, in the company that I worked for, you didn't lean on no shovel. You used it. Or whatever tool you had in your hand. There was no loafing around, goofing off, taking too much time on a job, dragging it out, taking too long of breaks. There was none of that. Because sure enough, as soon as you ever stop to pour a cup of coffee, here come the boss, Rondagonia, pulling up. And uh, so I learned to work. God had, that, had me there for a reason. I was a young man, had no idea what I was doing in life. And God had to show me how to do a man's work, how to earn a man's wage, how to, how to keep myself busy doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing. So then when I finally, I, I moved into the pastor's office and it was difficult for me. Because I still felt like that I needed, I always kept my door open. And if I'd hear somebody, you know, going to walk down the hall, I'd grab a pen, look like I was writing something down. I got to look busy. And God dealt with me. Mike, <clears throat> your new job description is this. Study the Word. Meditate on the Word. Think on these things in the Word. And so, God kind of helped me with that, kind of transition into that to where a lot of times I'd be sitting there and I'd read something for a while and then I would just sit at my desk and I would think about it. I would see if maybe there was something else it was connected to in scriptures and so on. And then, then uh, a couple years after that, this software jumps in my lap and I'm able to search through the scriptures in a way I'd never been able to do before. And it just opened up the whole Bible to me in a way that I never, never really thought possible before. And, uh, and, I, and I, love, I love studying now the Word of God. And pondering these things and thinking about these things and how they apply not just to my life, 
But then how would they apply to other people's lives as well? And uh, <clears throat> so I like to study. I like to uh, hit on a subject and then try to get as much out of that as I possibly can. Here we are. How long have we been in the book of Revelation? Who was president? I think it was Obama. But I told you it was. I told you it's going to take us a long time to get through here. I'm not, I'm not in any hurry. Amen? And if Jesus comes back next week, he'll fill in the rest of it for us. And then I'll figure out where I was wrong and all that stuff. But anyway... Revelation 17, I've had this on my mind all week. And again, I don't know how many sermons I'm going to preach out of it. Uh, but today, there is one particular message that I believe God would have me preach. You have your Bible there in Revelation 17, say amen. amen. The subject, the overall subject that I'm going to be dealing with is Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots. And abominations of the earth. And uh, to try to gain an understanding of what spirit that is, what that spirit does, how to recognize that spirit, um, the type of destruction that Babylon leaves uh, in her wake, and how she is the exact opposite of Jerusalem above, which is free, which is the mother of us all. So here you have two cities, two competing cities. You have Babylon, that great city, which is full of whoredoms. Then you have heavenly Jerusalem, which is the greater city, where there is no whoredoms. Amen. And uh, heavenly Jerusalem does not birth sinners. Jerusalem above births saints. Somebody say amen. But we're going to deal with the first part of her name this morning. So read along with me. Revelation chapter 17 verse 1. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me, come hither. I will shew thee unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now for God to call this city or this woman a whore, he's telling the truth. He's telling the truth. It is not necessarily meant to be derogatory without a cause. God is saying it how he sees it. And so in verse 3, with whom the kings of the earth hath committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now we're seeing some sins mentioned here. We're seeing fornication. We're seeing drunkenness. We're seeing wine bibbers here. And it's the wine of her fornication. You know, what is that they say in bars and taverns? That if you get to a bar, let's say at 11 o'clock, and there's no woman there that's even halfway good looking, just keep drinking until one. And then they start, start getting prettier. How true is that? Sadly to say, it's very true. Keep drinking, they'll get, they'll get prettier. Mickey Gilly wrote that song, The Girls All Get Prettier at Closing Time. Well, Mickey Gilly just died here while, not too long ago. I wonder where he is. You know, him and Jerry Lee Lewis and Jimmy Swagger, they're all first cousins. And all three of them boys got their start playing the piano. Guess where? The church. So in verse 3, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. This is the beast out of Revelation 13, I believe. Full of names of blasphemy. 
having seven heads and ten horns. That's, he's describing the beast. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. She's the scarlet woman of fables. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Now she has a cup, a golden cup in her hand. And look at what's in that cup. Full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. Underline that, Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. I want us to pray, and, and you pray for me this morning, because I'm about to say something that's going to shock you, and I don't know if I should say it or not. So pray for me, that if God don't want me to say it, that I just, he, he shuts my mouth. God's done that before. If I'm, I'm wanting to say it, I'm going to say it. And if God's in it, I'm going to say it. And it's going to shock you. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I do come to you this morning. And Lord, you know how, you know how this message got laid on my heart. Lord, you know what has happened. You know the things that I know. Father, you know more about them than I do and ever will know. God, I'm asking you to help me while I preach this. Lord, my, um, my goal here is to not, to not force anyone away from you or turn anyone away from you. My goal, Lord, what I, my sincerest heart's desire is that something that I say today will convict a sinner. And they will want to turn from their sins and live for you. Now, Lord, they're going to be afraid because they've tried to do right before and it's never worked. But... Father, I, I just know, Jesus, that if you get involved, it'll work. Because where we're weak, you're very strong in. So, Father, I ask you, God, Lord, to help me preach this. And, Father, the things that I want to say this morning, Lord, I, I just ask you, God, uh, to either put it in my mind, help me to say it, or just draw me away from it. And I won't say it. But Lord, it, it really is the reality of where we are right now as a nation, as a, as a society, as a people. Lord, as, as people all over this country are going into church services all around this country this morning. Lord, some of those people are re really are your people. But I'm afraid, God, that a vast majority of those people will never see the glories of heaven. They'll never see it. And it'll be this, it will be for this reason right here. So, Father, speak through me, speak to me, deal with me. <clears throat> Deal with those, Lord, that are here, those that are online. I just pray, dear God, that you would open up our eyes to our secrets. Bless your word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, I'm not going to get <clears throat> too far away from where I'm wanting to go with this. I could, I could talk for probably a good 30, 45 minutes on mystery itself, mystery religions. 
And there have been mystery religions all throughout the world. They have secret doctrines, secret practices, uh, secret ceremonies, secret rites, secret rituals, secret handshakes, uh, secret code words that they share amongst others. There are secret societies. Uh, there are mystery religions. In fact, probably most, most of the Catholic service is a mystery doctrine. They talk about the mystery of the Eucharist and the mystery of baptism and the mystery of the bread and the mystery of this, the mystery of marriage and the mystery of the... Everything in the Catholic Church is one big mystery. And according to them, it's not for us to really know about that, but I, I disagree with that. But I'm not going to get into that this morning. I'm going to deal with this... With, with what... I, I want you to think of, of Babylon. Think of Babylon, a, a woman who runs the world's largest escort service. Now, you know what that means, don't you? I'm not talking about a, a, a group of cars following you and escorting you to where your destination is. An escort service, there's probably escort services in this county. There's probably escort services. Uh, am I right on that, Cubs? Escort services, Jefferson County, okay. Escort services, St. Louis, St. Louis City, St. Louis County. You remember the, um, the uh, D.C. madam several years ago? She ran a high dollar escort service in Washington, D.C. She had a little black book full of names that were people that we voted into office. And they found her hanging in her parents' shed. A week after she went on a radio program and the guy asked her, now you're not planning on committing suicide anytime soon, are you? She said, no, I'm going to see this thing through to the end. And within the week they found her hanging somewhere. Somebody, somebody knew how dangerous she was. There's some people who do things wrong. And they want to keep those things secret at all costs. Nobody can know about this. And what I'm talking about this morning is secret sins. Secret sins. Turn to Second Samuel chapter 12. <clears throat> Now, there for a while, it left my mind what I was going to say. But, it's back in there now. So, I'm going to say it. I'm not going to give you names. Not even going to give you or supply you any hint whatsoever. But, somebody, and I know who it is, somebody in our church, was caught with illegal underage pornography on their phone. That's a secret that they don't want out. That's a very dangerous, wicked secret. And sometimes people will stop at nothing to make sure that that secret never sees the light of day. I had to, uh, I was asked, this year, took place years ago, this event I'm talking about now is different than what I just said but <clears throat> years ago there was a lady 
she worked in our daycare and the police came to her house and asked her, is your husband home? And I, don't, I can't remember if he was home right then or not. But the police were there as part of an investigation because one of the hotels in this town, her husband was a guest in and he used the hotel's Wi-Fi to download hundreds of illicit pictures of underage and burn them onto a CD and then left the hotel, packed the stuff up and left the hotel, but he forgot the CD. When the hotel went in to clean the room, they noticed the CD on there and they took it down to the office. It was whoever was in this room, they left this CD here. Well, somebody at the hotel popped that in the computer and saw what was on it. It was just full of images. And so they looked at who was in that room last. Well, this man's name came up. Now, he lived in this area. There's no real reason for him to be going over to this hotel. This, his wife asked me to go talk to him. And I did. And I told him, I said, you know, you can take this opportunity right now to get your life right with God. You'd be amazed at what God will do for you. But the uh, detectives in the city of Festus, since they could not actually prove that it was his computer that downloaded the images, even though he was the last one in the room, since they couldn't prove that part of the case, they dropped the charges and let the man go. Also, and I will not, I will not reveal the name but a young person in this church has been attacked on multiple occasions. And that's all I'm going to say. These are called secret sins. They are sins that we don't want anybody to find out about. These are sins that if it was made known that so-and-so was doing them, well, it would bring such embarrassment and such torture to their lives. And yet, the fear of that for some reason, does not stop them from doing it. Now, you know the story of David. How that David, who had, by his, by his uh, captain's advice, was told, David, is too important for you to be out here in battle with us. We can't have the light of Israel going out. David... Why don't you stay in the palace while we go fight the wars? David ended up taking that advice. But what that did was that gave David free time. While David was spending his free time up on the, up on the roof of his house, I tend to believe David knew what was going on up there. I think David figured out one day that if he stood up on the, the rooftop of his palace that he, he could actually see down into a place where the women went to bathe themselves. And sure enough, there is David up on the roof of his house, and he's watching this particular woman bathe herself. 
and it turns into lust, and that lust, it just will not leave David's mind. So he says, I'm the king, I guess I can do whatever I want. He called for this woman to come visit him in his palace. He lay with her, sent her home. Then she sent word to David, uh, David, I'm, I'm with child. And my husband is one of your soldiers, and he's been gone now for months. So it's about to be obvious that it's not my husband's. So you know what David did, right? He called for her husband, Uriah the Hittite. There's a list of David's mighty men. Men that stood firm for David and fought for David and stood behind David and would have gladly given their lives for King David. And Uriah the Hittite is on that list. Uriah the Hittite was one of David's best soldiers. So he sent to have Uriah, her, this husband, to come home to be with his wife to cover up the pregnancy. Uriah slept on David's porch steps. David said, why don't you go home? Go home. That's why I brought you in. Go home. Go be with your wife. And Uriah, being the mighty man that he was, said, I'm not going to go in and enjoy the comforts of my home, my wife's cooking, and my wife's love, and while my fellow soldiers are out there in the heat of battle. Well, that backfired. So David sent him back out there, and he sent word to the captain of the host out there, put Uriah on the front line of the battle, and make sure he never makes it out of there alive. David had him murdered. Now, just because David kept it a secret, just because Bathsheba kept it a secret, did God know about it? Be sure your sins will find you out. So Nathan the prophet comes. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was to come to him. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. David has not figured out yet who Nathan's talking about. Verse 7. Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. David, that story I just told is about you. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel, of Judah, and, and if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. You know what God's saying here? David, if you, if you wanted... If you wanted 20 more women, I'd give you 25 more women. David, if you didn't think you had, you had a big enough palace, I would have built you a bigger palace. David, if you need more horses, I'll give you horses. David, I've done everything for you. How dare you go and steal that man's wife? 
from him. I would have moreover given unto thee such and such things. Verse 9, Wherefore, how hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up an evil against thee out of thine own house. Do you know who that was? Who knows who that was? Absalom. It first started with Amnon, David's son, who raped David's daughter, his sister. Then when Absalom found out that Amnon raped their sister. Amnon killed, or Absalom killed Amnon. And I'm, I guess by that time, Absalom's probably thinking, uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think the old man's got it anymore to run the children of Israel. So I think I'll just take over daddy's throne. And that's what he tried to do. Verse 10 again, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. Did you know that, that exact thing happened? Because when Absalom was trying to take over David's throne, he asked, I think it was Ahithophel, he asked Ahithophel, who used to be David's counselor, what do you think I ought to do? I mean, we got David here, and how, how can I get the people to come to my side? And his counselor told him, take all of your father's concubines up to the roof of the palace, and we'll put a little place up there for you, and you lie with your father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Look what that says. I'll take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. That's exactly what happened. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. They did it right on the roof of David's house so that everybody could see it. Everybody. Everybody has secret sins to one degree or another. Some of them are not too big a deal, while some of them, you could probably go to prison for a very, very long time. We had a, a culture in this country for years where a lot of girls and I'm talking about years ago were being abused by a family member or a neighbor even even the boys being abused by a family member or a neighbor Someone close. And because of the culture of the day, that was all hush-hush. We can't, we can't talk about that. We don't, I don't want to hear that. And a lot of women and a lot of men suffered. Suffered. Because of that silence. And the people who did it they may think they got away with it. But let me remind you of one thing. In God's courtroom, no one gets away with anything. Be sure your sin will find you out. And he said in verse 12, same chapter, For thou didst it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. 
And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And, and if you want to write in the margin there next to that verse in your Bible, write Psalm 51. Where David writes one of his most beautiful psalms. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. I have sinned against the Lord, and Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Do you know what this, this right here is teaching us? It is teaching us the doctrine of the substitutionary death of the innocent for those who are guilty. Think of this child now as Christ when he comes the first time. Christ is the child who didn't do anything wrong. And yet, every one of our filthy, nasty, secret sins were laid upon him and he had to die for it. While we go free. The child that is born unto thee shall surely die. Sure enough, that child died. Do you know who the second child was that David had with Bathsheba? Does anybody know who the second child, after the, after the first one died, who was the second child? Huh? King Solomon, the wisest, greatest king to ever inhabit shoe leather in this world other than Christ was Solomon the king. Now I'm here to tell you, God can take the worst thing that you did and turn it into a blessing. But you must repent. Because this deed has thou given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child that is also that is born under thee shall surely die. Psalm 44, 21, Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. God not only knows all of the secret sins that you did before you got saved, after you got saved, and up to this day, but God knows this secret sins that you're going to commit from here to the day of your death. He knows all of them. Why try to hide them from God? Because God knows them all. He knows them all. Jeremiah 23, 24. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Saith the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Is there any place that you can hide from God? And the answer is no. Why would you think that you can commit a sin that no one knows about? When the truth of it is, God always knows. God's, God's known it for years that you were going to do this. It is the most foolish, dumb, ignorant thing that we can do is to think that we can continue committing secret sins and go on living that way and it'll be okay. I can keep this covered up. Be sure your sins will find you out. Now, Daniel 2.28, there's a God in heaven that reveals his secrets. So let me, uh, I don't know if this is in my notes, yeah, it is in my notes. Turn to Matthew 18. Here's, what, here's how God is going to take care of secret sins. Here's how God's going to do it. And if there's something in your life that you're doing that you would rather die 
than for people to find out. You better listen to this. I got, a, I got an email from a lady a few years ago. She said, Pastor Mike, please pray for our church. She said, we had a pastor, and we all loved him. But he went out into the woods last weekend with a gun, and he blew his brains out. And what would cause a pastor to go to that extreme? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what happened. That pastor started grooming boys in that church. And I don't know exactly how many, but that pastor ended up molesting several of them. And probably for a while... He thought he had gotten away with it. Until the FBI came to his house, knocked on his door. And they informed him that he was under investigation. After that, he went out into the field, into the woods, and shot himself. Because he could not bear the idea of his sins being brought out into the light of day. So here's how, here's how God's going to deal. This is how God deals with me. This is how God deals with you. This is how God deals with you. This is how God deals with all you online. Matthew 18, verse 15. Je this is Jesus now. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained a brother. Now, the, this first step, do you, know what, do you know what the motivation is for this? The motivation, the number one goal is that this person that has sinned, no matter how grievous, how wicked, how evil the sin was, this person that has sinned, you're going to them in an effort to cause them to confess and repent of the sin. And as of that moment, it's forgiven, it's gone, and nobody else in the world needs to know about it. Can I, say, can I hear you say amen? You know, my children... My adult children have come to their mama or their daddy to tell me things that they got caught up in. You want to know what they were? I'm not telling you. You know why I'm not telling you? Because they came... And we prayed and we asked God's forgiveness and they were forgiven. And as far as, as far as God, myself, and my children, it's over with. But I will tell you this. There were some people who decided it's not over with. And they found out and they went blabbing it all over the place. 
Is that right? Is that right to do that? You want us to do it to you? So here's what I think God does first. God sees you what you're doing. And the first person to come to you is the Holy Ghost. And he rattles you a little bit and shakes you. And the Holy Ghost has a little talk with you and says, you need to repent. You need to, you need to repent. You need to get this Get it under the blood. And did you know that if you'll do that, God says, forgotten. I'm going to cast it as far as the east is from the west. And I'm going to bury it under the deepest sea so that it will never come back on you again. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. But, if you don't do that, Jesus then tells you what he's going to do next. Jesus is going to let somebody that you know, know what you did. And they're going to come to you. You know, I've had that happen to me. In the years that I've been pastoring here. I've had people that I love, people that I care about, people that I trust, people that were my friends come to me and say, Mike, I need to talk to you for a minute. And I'm so glad they did. So glad they did. Now, once God doesn't get anything out of you, then he sends somebody to you that says, I know, I know what you did. I, I, I wasn't looking, I wasn't spying on you, but I just saw this. And there's no way, this is your, this is your sin. I, now that I know it, I have to come to you and I would love to bring you back into the fellowship of God's people. Will you repent? Now, you could say, well, that, that wasn't, I didn't have anything to do with that. God knows my heart. You can invoke that God thing if you want. I'll tell you, that's not the good, that's not the right call to make. That's not a good move. Because if you are guilty and then you invoke God, God, only God can judge me. Well, you're asked for it. You asked for it. So then here's what's going to happen. Verse 16, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Now we got three people in on it. Three people are going to your house, knocking on your, on your door, asking to come in, sitting down with you in your living room, tears rolling down their eyes saying, will you please repent? Listen, I told you a while ago that God's I, 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 I don't I don't owe anybody anything. I didn't do that. That's not that's not me. God's God knows my heart. I'm inside the will of God. I read the Bible every day. I do this and I do that. And there's no way I'm guilty of that. OK. If you repent, then it's to stay right there. Who agrees with that? Say amen. Verse 17, and if he shall neglect to hear thee, tell it unto the church. So now we have to have a meeting. We have to call in the members. And whether you show up or not is irrelevant. We would like for you to come. We would like to pray with you. Your church will support you. Your church, they're sinners just like you are. 
But we have to now bring it before the entire church. It has to be told to everybody in that church what you did. But if he shall neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. And this is where he says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that, that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. God is in this thing all the way. And God wants you to repent. He does not want to cast you out of the church. For goodness sakes, I don't want to cast you out of the church. But I've had to do it. I've had to do it. One family in particular several years ago, we did exactly this. Confronted them, confronted them, confronted them. They denied, they lied. And finally I said, I'm going to dismiss you. I'm going to put you out. They ended up leaving here, going to another church in this town. Who I knew the pastor, he was a friend of mine. Six months later, Brother George, that pastor called me and he said, Do you know such and such family? I said, Yeah. He said, Tell me about them. I told him what happened. He said, We're going to have to put them out too. He said, they're troublemakers. They're starting trouble everywhere. You know what the guy, the guy that I asked to leave this church, you know what he said to me? He said, we've been kicked out now of five churches. That's like a guy saying, I've had, I've had five, I've been through five divorces already. I don't know what's wrong with these women. I don't think it's the woman. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Everybody has secret sins. Everybody does. The ones that you commit inside of your heart are the ones nobody can see you, see you doing, but you're doing it. Covetousness, that, that goes on inside the heart. Nobody knows you're coveting something. Lust of the eyes, nobody, nobody knows that. Lust of the flesh, pride of life. I'm asking you. That, that part of Babylon's name, mystery. She's the one who always leads you to transgression and then teaches you ways that you can cover it up. By the way, let me say this to anybody who's listening to me right now. And you are secretly... Downloading things onto your computer, your laptop, your phone, whatever it is. There are the, the governments of the various states and the federal government have had to set up task forces all over the country. Because of underage pictures. And I'm telling you that they monitor and track traffic, internet traffic. Some of those images are secretly tagged with identifying software so that whenever you download it on your computer or your phone or whatever it is, it sends out your IP address. In other words, they know you have it. And one of these days, you're going to get a knock on your door that you don't want. Let's bow our heads.
God is a good God. There are sins that I've committed that I told God. And it was just between me and God. There's been some times where there were sins that I committed that I had to tell to other people. Now I don't ever want to have to go through that again. Your best shot, the best thing you can have going for you is to seek out God's mercy on you right now. And then to say, God, I cannot promise you that I will never do this again because God, it just eats me up. But God, would you please beat me and beat me and chastise me and beat me until you have beaten this thing right out of me? Because I don't want it. I don't want it anymore. Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord, I love preaching on the mercy of God. I love preaching on it. You are a merciful God. You're a God of tender compassion. You're a God full of love and tenderness and mercies and forgiveness and tears and joy that somebody's come to you and say, God, I'm so sorry. Father, if there be anyone listening to my voice who has secret sins, that if they were found out, it would, it would just be the end of their life practically. They're that scared. And Lord, the devil knows how to lay these traps very well. Father, if there's anybody listening to me right now, before you have to get somebody they know involved, God, would they cry unto you this morning in sincerity and in truth? Would they ache, Father, with their tears rolling down their face, crying, Pleading with you, God, have mercy on them. God, I believe you'll have mercy on them. I believe you'll forgive the sins. I believe, God, that you will bury it in the deepest sea. And nobody, nobody will ever find it out because it's been forgiven. God forbid anyone associated with this church to have their secret sins and think they can keep them and keep doing them and keep it in secret. And not only then when they're caught, not only drag the name of Jesus through the sin pile of their life, but they drag this church right along with them. God, to those, Lord, who are unrepentant. Father, I pray, God, that you would chasten them and beat on them until they repent. But, Father, if they refuse, then let their sin be upon them and the consequences thereof. And there will be no mercy. Father, forgive us. All we like sheep have gone astray. Wash our hands, wash our hearts, wash our minds. Draw us away from the wicked crowd. 
Teach us, Father, to do right always so that we can lay our head down at night in absolute peace, knowing, God, that you have forgiven us of everything. Father, speak to those. Speak, Father, speak this message, Lord, long past this morning to anyone who needs to hear it. I pray your blessings on it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, would you stand to your feet?